So good evening, welcome everybody. We are waiting for some more participants. Thank you for joining our event today. So welcome everybody, good evening. Hello everyone, welcome to our lecture series, Sustainable Romania. Today on the topic, uh, city of future towards a more sustainable urban mobility. My name is Annalena Koschek from the Bucharest office of Friedrich Ebert Foundation. And I'm very pleased to welcome you together with my colleague, Victoria, uh, to our event. Thank you for your time and uh, your interest in today's topic. In the series of events, we are discussing questions of how to increase sustainability and the question of mobility, especially in the big cities, is a key question. I personally moved to Bucharest this year in June and as a passionate um, bicycle driver, I sometimes feel lonely on the streets of Bucharest. So I also have a very personal interest in today's topic and I'm very interested to hear what you are thinking about the future of mobility in Romania, but also especially in the big cities like Bucharest. This is my personal experience, but to give us some background information, um, here's some information that we published the last days on our website, Monitor Social. I will also share the, the link with you um, in the chat that you can see all the information I will share with you um, during the next minutes. From 2015 to 2020, the number of cars in the European Union increased by 10%, while the number of cars in Romania increased by 41%. It's the largest increase in the EU. And every 10th car newly re registered, uh, registered in European Union during this period was reg registered in Romania. Especially in Bucharest, Ilpov remained, uh, region remains the region with the largest number of passenger cars, um, which means in numbers 1,387,000 cars, cars uh, in 2020. That's an increase of 31% from 2015. The huge increase in the number of passenger cars in Romania, especially in the big cities, along with poor road infrastructure improvements are one of the reasons for the increase in road congestion and the pollution due to, to uh, car traffic. Um, having a look at the bicycle infrastructure, uh, infrastructure it's um, a quite similar um, picture. European bicycle production has steadily increased from 1.9 million in 2017 to 13.5 million in 2021. And in 2021, Romania produced almost 20% of all bicycles produced in the Euro European Union, which means a number 2.5 million bicycles. Only Portugal uh, is producing more. But the countries with the highest bicycle production are also the countries with the lowest rates of use of bicycles. A recent Greenpeace report shows that only 1% of the share of trips from Bucharest are made by bicycle, 1%. In fact, Bucharest is also on the last places in terms of walking trips with only 15% of trips made on food. By comparison, more than a quarter 25% of trips from Amsterdam or Copenhagen is done by bike. So the question is, how can we Copenhagenize our cities? And I'm very happy to um, welcome our 
today's expert, Lorenz Siegel. Um, he worked in bicycle infrastructure. He's part of um, Copenhagenized nice Design. He's planning and implementing best practice infrastructure and develops communication strategies from California to Kazakhstan. So we are very happy to welcome you. And um, yes, I will hand over to you. The floor is yours. We will have uh, an input from your side um, about half an hour. And then you are all invited to discuss with us um, how to, yeah, what is what about the future of mobility in Romania and Bucharest. Welcome, Lorenz Siegel. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. I uh, hope uh, you can all hear me. Uh, and if that's the case, I'll, <laughs> I'll go ahead. Uh, yeah, again, um, thank you so much for the invite. Um, I'm, my name is Lawrence Siegel. I'm a transportation planner, I would say in general, or active mobility consultant. And uh, I'm now working for uh, over six years for Copenhagenize or with Copenhagenize. And uh, Copenhagen as a, as a company is kind of trying to um, make like cycling a little bit easier uh, for people. Um, we, um, I would say, have in general like three core keystones uh, that we work in. Um, we do communication strategies uh, that ideally um, kind of are being implemented alongside actual infrastructure change. Uh, then we do, um, like we host workshops, we do master classes that should have a, a bit of a like educational aspect to them. And we also like to do research. Uh, that's why we try to publish every couple of years our ranking of the most uh, bicycle friendly cities um, and to share like what makes those cities so bicycle friendly and um, ideally like uh, have some positive influence on other cities in terms of inspiration. Our core business uh, right now, um, and hopefully in the future as well, is the planning of actual infrastructure and like working with uh, cities to uh, kind of um, implement um, like bicycle master plans or active mobility plans or however you want to call it. And I would like really love to say that it is an easy job to change uh, like people's mobility patterns, their daily routines, or also that it's easy to change uh, like policy and, and how like politicians look at uh, active transportation. Um, but it's not really easy. It's, it's, it's pretty hard. And uh, the reason for that is that when you want to change mobility patterns and you want to change um, how people uh, choose their daily mode of transport, you kind of have to change the environment around them. Um, and this is kind of a two-way street. It's not um, it's not just a one-way street. It goes both way, it goes both ways. And I mean uh, with that that when you change or when you want to reliably change mobility habits, um, you have to change the environment and the environment changes through those mobility habits. And um, in that way, uh, we have like a situation where if you want to change something, it sometimes just takes a while until like those two things even out. And it's kind of um, like when you look at our like, like the people we want to produce those infrastructure changes for, um, like those two people uh, on, on, on this photo, um, you kind of have to like work really closely with uh, municipalities and um, like find out what like the needs of those people are, like because we're not trying to change uh, the cycling environment for people who are already cycling. Uh, we're trying to change the environment for people who want to maybe cycle in the future. So, and today we're going to talk a little bit about how we change that environment so it fits those people and also what the benefits are if you're willing to do so. First, I'd like to actually dive a little bit into some historical footage of how cities used to look 
and how people use the environment around them. So you can see here like quite nicely that uh, cities used to be, or streets used to be something of a kind of also not only spatial network, but also kind of a social network. So you kind of, you hung out on the street, you uh, used it differently as today. Today the street is like mostly reserved for motorized transport. Um, and an old footage you can see bicycles everywhere and it's not only footage from Copenhagen, you can um, dive into footage from here, like Los Angeles, for example. This is a raced bicycle highway from the 1920s. Um, and uh, it's a good example of like back then when 20% 20 20 of the people uh, in, in Los Angeles took their bike to work and to, to school, um, you ended up with that kind of amazing infrastructure like uh, even today this would be kind of like mind-blowing if, if if you would see that anywhere in the world um but los angeles kind of moved away from that um like most cities in on, uh, on this planet and i mean this like picture of los angeles is probably not very shocking it's like uh, those monstrosities are uh like i think they call them interchanges they're everywhere and um you can see actually quite nicely that even if this is not like packed with cars uh, on that photo, uh, it doesn't really matter. You can't really cross here unless you're on a car or on a plane or a helicopter to get from one side of the picture to the other side. So how did we get there? Like how, when I say like mobility patterns are not easy to change, it's often like a very static um, thing like that we just have in our society. How do we come from this in like a couple of decades to um, to this? And what happened is like quite simply put the rise of the automobile utopia. So we have uh, a new form of transport that is uh, or like was started to be in the fifties uh, of the twentieth century starting to become more and more affordable, more and more people could. Uh, were able to to buy a car and with more and more people driving around it completely changed uh, the cities um, from from before to after and with the changing of the built environment also the traffic planning got completely derailed when we look at how people went from a to b on the left side of this image um on on bike and and on foot it was a pretty straight line it was like a pretty straightforward endeavor and starting with the 50s you could see that um it completely changed and the only mode of transport that got you directly from a to b without any problems was 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 the car it became the car it was made to be the car and when we like look in like recent at recent events in March 2020 like a lot of people thought that we entered like another breaking point in mobility in a way like a, a big shift is about to happen people stayed at home they have to stay at home um and if they went to work they choose to bike like there were like suddenly in a lot of cities cyclists everywhere and the cities reacted like this is an image from Berlin and um, you can suddenly seeing those cities that bike lanes suddenly had the actual width that we would recommend uh, to safely cycle on from uh, being too narrow before. And it was because of social distancing. It was like kind of a, to, for, for people to feel comfortable um, and uh, to um, kind of catch all those like cyclists that were suddenly popping out of seemingly nowhere. And when you, look at like where these cyclists are coming from it was often kind of a cannibalization of other modes of transport that we actually want to preserve uh like public transport is a is is an amazing thing and there's like no uh goal in in, in cycle planning to take people from public transport and transfer them on the on, on, on bikes we try to like ideally um people out of the cars and onto the bikes and into into metros and buses 
So what happened like in, in the last two years was um, that people who felt uncomfortable in uh, like metro and bus started to cycle. And oftentimes the like people who traveled by car uh, like continued to do so because like they were alone and felt safe. So in a way, um, what we're looking at still today and we'll see what like the outcomes of in the long run of the of the of the pandemic of the last two years like what kind of um regulation it will happen on mobility planning but momentarily i would still say that traffic planning is stays very much derailed um and especially when we look at the the cycling path on the on the on the right graphic um like how kind of detached it is from each other like this lack of a network this uh kind of like short stretches of bicycle uh like bike lanes everywhere around the city this is something that you've seen even in cities that kind of declare themselves of, of, of like being bicycle friendly and like kind of committing to the cause in 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 a way so uh this kind of like single bike lanes all over the city that aren't really connected is a big problem and it's something that we would like to tackle. Bertrand de uh was uh, the mayor of Paris uh, almost for like 15 years uh, at the beginning of the century. And he once said, I don't know if he said it like during he was mayor or when he was still up for election, because it's kind of a bold uh, statement, I have to say, like in a city like Paris. But he said it. Um, and he said the fact is that the automobile has kind of no longer a place in, in our today's cities or maybe tomorrow's cities. And when you, like, we always took this statement quite literally. It's, 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 it's a space issue. Like, uh, it, it is really often a question when you um, talk to traffic planners um, around the world, how many, like, cars, uh, like, level of service, how many cars can we move down the street? And we tried to, like, turn this around and, and kind of spread the word that you actually with the same street width and um, with the same kind of street layout just changed the 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 like percentage uh of 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 usage you can have like 10 times the capacity of uh, like bringing people down the street uh in comparison to before and when you look at this image uh, from, from Copenhagen, you can actually see just like this kind of arrogance of space that like, uh, like single occupied vehicles take up in our like urban landscape, even in Copenhagen. Um, but like there you can also see like what like 51 cycles take up uh, in, in terms of space on a, on a, on a street layout like this. Um, and also, uh, like pretty much the same um, occupation uh, versus uh, square meters uh, in the bus. So we try to kind of um, like publish more modern traffic planning and try to promote modern traffic planning in a way where kind of reliable, safe uh, uh, transport like like cycling or walking does have kind of the right of way uh, in the city and is able to like perform those trips straightforward from A to B and to really make it a little bit more difficult for the car to get around to give an incentive to people to change their mobility habits because that's what it's all about. So what are we talking about when we talk about cycling? Um, that's also probably something that uh, Kind of makes a difference to a lot of people because we talk about it as a mode of transportation for the 99 percent so basically like it used to be in, in in a lot of cities around the world for generations when the bicycle was still like something that you kind of used on a day-to-day -day basis and uh decisively we don't see it as a sport or recreational tool it is obviously a sport and recreational tool as well but we work for a uh, different perception of the bicycle. So some of them are on the bicycle as a legitimate mode of transport. And 
it's a bit in the name as well, obviously, of our company. Um, there are different reasons why we always look at Copenhagen as this kind of role model for uh, bicycle planning and uh, kind of bicycle culture in a way as well. Um, there are obviously other great cities uh, like Amsterdam, Utrecht, uh, to name a few, um, that have uh, like large numbers of people cycling where the cycling, uh, where the bicycle really arrived as the main mode of transport in the city. But for us, Copenhagen offers something of a transferability, like an easy to understand system. Um, and that's one of the reasons why uh, we kind of carry this like shield of Copenhagen in front of us. Copenhagen is, it always like uh, has like this reputation of being kind of a, like a small city for like this, uh, this uh, like a famous metropolitan thing it is, but it is, it has like quite a big of a, of a metropolitan area. Uh, it has 4.2 million people, including uh, some of the part of it that um, we count to the metropolitan area, which is actually in Sweden. Um, but a lot of people like travel from outside into Copenhagen and a lot of them travel by bike. Um, and when we take a look into Copenhagen, we see like in the core, um, what used to be one of the main arteries for car traffic into the city in the 50s, 60s and 70s now is actually the busiest bicycle intersection in the world. Um, this is a photo I took uh, when I was uh, living in Copenhagen. And this is kind of like the most beautiful traffic jam that you can imagine. It's like, it's so like silent and crisp. Um, and you can just like, you know, just hear a little bit of bells ringing, but there's like, it feels like the right place to be. It feels, it feels right. Um, not unlike, unlike a car traffic jam, I would say. And um, so this is like at every green cycle um, in the morning, you have like this massive like bulk of cyclists just building up. And this is kind of a good representation how like morning traffic in Copenhagen uh, works on a daily basis. Um, we have at this intersection 42,000 cyclists that come through every day and 86% of the traffic on this uh, bridge is uh, our, our bikes. Um, on a more like citywide scale, we have 49% of people in Copenhagen who uh, take their bike every day to uh, work and education. Um, that includes people who come from outside into Copenhagen. Um, we have 63% of the trips that start and end in Copenhagen are made by bike. And 75% of those cycle all year. Um, this is not like typical of uh, this image. <laughs> I have to say like Copenhagen has a couple of days of snow uh, a year uh, probably and they're pretty like good in maintaining the street um, more or less um, most of the times. But what Copenhagen has is like a nasty kind of uh, wind situation. So like the weather per se is maybe for the lack of snow, it makes up in the wind. And if you don't believe me, you can ask um, this guy or I love this picture. It's just this determination that even in like uh, conditions like this, people just choose to bike because it's easier for them and it's faster and quicker and yeah, which like leads us to the question, why are people cycling in Copenhagen uh, and why is the city so like behind this, this, this whole thing? Um, and one of the big reasons, obviously, I touched a little bit already, it creates a lot of space. Uh, we said before, 10 times capacity in, in, certain, in certain situations. In this example, we have like 1,300 cars coming through every hour and we have like 5,900 people on uh, their bikes traveling through. So it's a highly effective mode of transport. This is something that is, that is often kind of brushed off. Um, this is from the bridge that we just saw before. And uh, there's like quite a bit of a transition that happened between uh, 2008 and 2016 
when the city decided to take away two car lanes and replace them with like, um, I think right now we have like five meter um, bike lanes in every direction. So like a diameter of 10 meter just for bikes. And uh, while like increasing 20% of capacity uh, of people who can travel through here, it, it did something else. It did uh, obviously like the cyclists went up, the cars went down a little bit. Um, but what's really, for me, fascinating is like the 1,400% rise in, in, in people just hanging out on that bridge uh, when it's a sunny day. Uh, the, the, the right side here is the sunny side. It became like kind of this like meeting point. What used to be uh, just at like driving through a uh, main artery for cars. So the travel patterns, again, change the environment around them and the environment then changes how people behave in those spaces. The second big uh, thing that like cycling does, it saves money. It saves money on an individual level because I don't have to buy a car, but it also saves money on the on the government's level. It's, the city of Copenhagen invested 300 million, um, which sounds kind of a lot uh, in, in bicycle infrastructure. Uh, over the last uh, 15 years, it invested in like uh, big infrastructure projects. Uh, like this is the, the bicycle snake in, in central Copenhagen that kind of created a link between two um, elevated parts of the city. And it's just a great project. It's like, it's a smooth trip, like cycling over it. Uh, but it wasn't cheap, uh, but it kind of like, got back all the money already that was got put into it. And the city calculates that Copenhagen has contributed 170 million um, every year through cycling. This comes in like pension costs, health costs, uh, social and economic costs. And uh, the city keeps conducting those like cost benefit analysis to kind of make a political statement um, and also Kind of deliver a reason why they um, kind of commit so much to 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 um, cycling as a mode of transport, and uh, during those like those numbers come out every year. They always change a little bit because it's a bit like some of it is a bit obviously hard to calculate. Uh, how do you calculate like the worth of, of 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 like a person's life, for example? So um, those numbers change always a little bit, but the the general like vibe is always the same. Every kilometer that you decide to cycle, you basically bring back 65 cents uh, into society. And for every kilometer you decide to drive a car, you cost society uh, 71 cents. Um, this is all in, like in the in the bicycle report of the city of Copenhagen, which is publicly available. Uh, and I invite you to to take a look at it. It's very like beautiful and, and easy to read. And um, to like explain this further, this kind of represents a graphic where you kind of like you sit on the sofa and you decide to cycle and then you have the left outcome. And when you decide to drive a car, you have the right outcome. So that is kind of like the doing nothing versus cycling versus uh, driving a car. That's how those um, get to, uh, like those, those graphics can come, come together. On an individual level, it's obviously also very interesting. So why do we have like 60% uh, motor share inside the city? Like when you ask a hundred Copenhageners why they cycle, um, most of them will say it's just fast and easy. It's like everything that a mode of transport should be. It's, it's fast and easy. The exercise is a nice side thing. Um, you can, like in this uh, survey, you can actually deliver multiple answers. So it's not their prior reason, but like it's uh, things they think of, they can think of um, when they choose their bike. Um, the money is like a bit in the background and um, like nobody cares about the environment seemingly. So, and this is kind of interesting because Cycling is always sold as something that kind of saves the planet and like we should all uh, do that to, to like, you know, uh, reach our CO2 uh, commuting carbon goals. But 
when you are on an individual level and people uh, like ask themselves what kind of thing I drive to work with, um, you just want to like you just want to get home. You just want to be like fast, quick, reliable, and if it's not like good for the figure, even better. Um, and what's also interesting here um, is that the first three, or let's let's start with the top. Uh, we start on, on the bottom, like cycling basically everywhere in the world, no matter like how safe it is or like how good the infrastructure is, will be cheap and it will be good for the or at least not bad for the environment. But only, it's only fast, easy, uh, fast and easy when you have good infrastructure, when you feel safe and when you actually are safe. So like the most important things why people cycle are always attached to like their built environment. I can't like do this anymore without talking about the environment. It's just, <laughs> I uh, like at some point you, you, you have to tackle it. It's also just such a low hanging fruit to talk about the benefits about, of like environmental goals. And it's also a great selling point for, for cities and countries around, around the world. When you actually explain them that the transport sector, for example, USA, UK, Spain, or France is the number one producer of CO2. Uh, in other countries like Germany, Canada, and Japan, it's the number two producer. So it's always kind of kind of up there. And the European Cycling Federation calculated, and like this is not like mind blowing. Um, the like five grams of CO2 per kilometer per person versus two hundred seventy one grams per person. Uh, ergo you can say like cycling uh, without surprise saves you almost like 100% of CO2 commuting carbon. Um, what's more interesting is like one electric bus would cost a city roughly $650,000 a year. It's, it's uh, the same right now, I think, uh, including the infrastructure and the maintenance of the bus. Um, like charging it, uh, so on and so forth. A kilometer of bike lane for a 50 kilometer street, so like a kind of a second sidewalk kind of situation like you find in Copenhagen would be $150,000 uh, or euros. So one bus equals four kilometers of bike lanes. And when you look at a city like Amsterdam, for example, uh, that has like 50, 500 kilometers of like actual bike lanes, um, not like the painted thing on the side that you often see. And they have also a great like electrical bus fleet. But to recreate the bus system, you can actually 40 times recreate their world-class, probably like best bicycle network in the world. This is something to consider, like when you think about like the future of urban mobility and it has to be like sustainable and so on and so forth, but it also has to be kind of affordable. So like having like 50 Amsterdams or one Amsterdam uh, with buses is kind of something that a lot of people will find kind of interesting. So um, when we like, of course, talk about the environment, at the same time, we always talk about money as well. And spending three billion on this or three billion on this will um, shift a lot of people's interest in one or the other direction. Um, the University of Montreal also conducted something of a study uh, that said the like implications of forty-five kilometers of actual good bike infrastructure has the same effect on greenhouse gas emission as basically transferring the whole bus system in Montreal into electric, like uh, electric buses from like diesel or gasoline or whatever they are now. So also like a huge investment that would have been necessary to do that. Um, and you couldn't do the same with 45 kilometers of bike lanes, meaning 45 kilometers of bike lanes create so many cyclists that you save that much greenhouse gas emissions. So when people ask me what like is like the number one thing that makes people cycle, it's infrastructure 
it's always infrastructure. We can't have uh, like a change in mobility habits if you don't change the environment, if we don't like bring bike lanes to a level that is acceptable for everyone who cycles for the first time. And this is like a, a graphic that we often use from um, the Portland Office of Transportation conducted in 2009, has been like repeated many times. And it asked people like how they like see themselves in, in terms of cycling. And there's always more or less, I, I would say like a third of people who say they would never cycle. It doesn't really cross their minds and it, like you can do whatever you want, but um, like that's it. And we call those like the, the no way, no how group. Um, we have like on the, on the right side, we have people who would cycle anyhow. Like it doesn't really matter what, what, you, what you put in front of them. Uh, in what city they, they drive around, they would cycle every day and they would cycle passionately. And uh, those are not the ones that we we probably are, are after the most. And then we have enthused and confident. That's probably something I would describe myself as uh, someone who, who cycles if the, if the like environment is uh, giving you the right implications. Um, but like the group that we're like most interested in are the interested but concerned group because it's like roughly always around 60 percent of the population that say oh yeah cycling sounds nice but i mean it's dangerous i don't want to do it but if like everything is kind of better and everything is kind of safer i would choose cycling um, at least at some days of the week and I mean, just imagine if you have like 8% or 60% or just like half of that, uh, reaching like a 40% 40, 40 modal share in every city would be amazing. So getting those two on their bikes requires the infrastructure um, that we see in Copenhagen, the infrastructure that we see in Amsterdam uh, or that they're building right now in, in Paris. And um, I said before, I mentioned before that Copenhagen has like this, this benefit of transferability. And that means that we can basically identify like kind of more or less four types of infrastructures that we can see in Copenhagen that um, are applicable to basically every situation more or less that you can find out there. Um, we start with like the lowest level of protection that you can use like until like, you know, 30 kilometers speed limit, uh, maximum of like roughly 2000 cars a day. That's uh, like a general shared space, uh, ideally traffic calmed. Um, this is an example from Copenhagen. It's a very extreme example. Like people are basically kind of reminds me of that like old image where just people just play on the street. The more like effective version of this would be the Fietstrade or bicycle street or Fahrradstrasse, or there's like a, a term in every language for this. Uh, and it's the Dutch version of a shared space where you um, have the same implication in terms of car traffic. It shouldn't be more than 30 kilometers an hour and it shouldn't be more than 2000 cars. But this is like a highly effective uh, space, for, uh, space for traveling on a bike. Uh, this probably not so much. So we have like the same situation in terms of like car traffic, but this one is more like for like celebrating uh, the A to B um, ness of, of, of cycling versus uh, more of a, like a backyard space. Moving up to like 40 to 50 kilometers an hour and 4,000 cars a day, you, we need a designated space for, for bikes. Ideally on the, on the on the right side of parked cars, something that's often like not done right because uh, since most cars have only one person in them, like ninety nine percent of cars have the person getting out on the left side of the car. So putting a bike lane on the left side of a car is kind of counterintuitive, uh, especially because it doesn't really take up less space than this. Then we come into territory that's almost like safe enough for most streets where like inside of a, inside of the city, you have like around 50 kilometers of an hour car travel. 
uh, 4,000 uh, like cars a day traveling there. This is a physical separation. Can be through bollards, can be like a second sidewalk, like it is in Copenhagen. There are many different ways of doing it, but there needs to be uh, like a protection for the cyclists using it. And the fourth kind of infrastructure that we can identify are like fully separated bike lanes that you can basically put next to a motorway. So this will basically get you through every situation. You just need like this built buffer uh, next to it. And there you go. When we look at those, like uh, when we look at Copenhagen, uh, when we look at images of Copenhagen and like mountains of, 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 of cyclists, we kind of like tend to think this is unachievable and it's kind of out of reach. And um, there are like a few ways of, 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 of tackling this. Like um, one of them I get to later, but like just looking at other uh, cities around the world where you can see that within a couple of years, we can actually achieve some, some, some really, really useful change. Um, when we look at Sevilla as a, as a good example for like within a year, they, uh, they built like uh, relatively um, big uh, amount of kilometers of bike lanes. And in Sevilla, it's like 40 degrees and, and uh, in, the, in the summer. So it's not like necessarily something um, like heat is always a big, uh, big problem when, it, when, when, when people talk about cycling, uh, heat, slope, um, those kind of things. And Sevilla had proven that, proven that it had like uh, seven folds, so seven times the amount of cyclists within one year of uh, creating uh, some kilometers of bike lanes, starting like, like to admit that pretty low, but you can just increase the number of cyclists and have like this base pool ready uh, with, with some easy infrastructure uh, installments. Bogota is another great example that, um, developed itself now with a with a very committed mayor to one of the most bicycle friendly cities I would say uh in the world um I think it ranked like uh, 12th in the, in the index if I if I remember that correctly uh Ljubljana which uh in the 70s and 80s built a really good network of bike lanes after like sending some city stuff to Copenhagen and actually getting some inspiration this actually looks like Copenhagen to be to be honest with you and um, they still have those today and, and uh, just, uh, I think, this year hosted the, the Velo City Conference. And uh, Helsinki, another Nordic city that is really, really committed to, to like the, 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 the whole cycling cause and uh, has, a, has a great uh, bicycle director, uh, Oskari. And like he once told me like when, when you look at like the we looked at a like difficult intersection at, at in, in Helsinki and I was like so like how do you solve it like solving is not the problem there's always like a tool to to make an intersection safe it's just like the political will in the end when you have that behind you you can basically like change everything it's like it's not like a question of oh we're not able to change an intersection so cyclists can can use it safely this is actually uh, a very good example of how a city uh, changes mobility patterns without building a meter of bicycle infrastructure. So uh, uh, the city is Ghent in, in, in Belgium um, that only with that, that changed only with traffic planning um, the whole um, mobility patterns of the whole city. Uh, and it works like this, that they, around the, the city core, uh, like divided the, the city into single um, um, districts that you can't drive from one into the other without going out into the ring. So it made basically car driving such a pain in the ass that people um, decided to, to look elsewhere. And um, we can also see this quite nicely um, so they started to like, like heavily traffic calm the, the inner city. Um, you couldn't like, as I said, drive from one district into the other and that like within, uh, basically overnight, uh, um, and I, I mean, literally they did this like kind of the traffic plan. You can change it overnight. You don't need to build anything. Um, 
it rose like bicycle traffic by 25% and then public transport by eight. And at the same time on urban boulevards, you had like a third of uh, less cars and on local roads, 60% less cars. And that like leaves uh, uh, the core of the city completely changed. Like it feels completely different from one day uh, to the next. So there is um, obviously an, an, an alternative to, to just, you know, concrete infrastructure, but um, I still advise like to, to, to at some point support this with the actual infrastructure. When you talk to the, the mayor of Ghent, he will, uh, he will tell you that after like, after that time, after that he implemented this traffic uh, planning uh, change, you have so much support in the community for uh, for cycling and walking that it's now an easy political uh, goal to change actually the infrastructure on those streets as well. So you basically create that political will through this like overnight transition. You you lay the groundwork for the approval of of the population and. Yeah, you can't talk about cycling these days without talking about Paris at least a little bit. Um, Paris like is a good example of uh, how also like the pandemic kind of um, accelerated like this long-term plan of, of, of the mayor of Paris to basically change every street in the city into something that where you can use your bike on. It's like pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, and uh, as I said, like the pandemic, the, the the kind of change of how people, how often they need to go to the office, and and how they wanna how they wanna get from A to B, uh, accelerated this whole trend. And this is uh, something that um, I'd like to add. Uh, you can obviously, I think the pandemic changed a lot of things, but without like the initial or original drive to 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 be committed to cycling, I think um, the pandemic has a very limited effect on in, 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 a, in a lot of cities in comparison to cities like Paris or Berlin, where you had like this, this commitment to cycling even before the pandemic. And then with the pandemic, you get like a lot of things moving. Um, <laughs> there's a little German that slipped into this presentation. Copenhagen wasn't always Copenhagen. This is like the second thing that we always explain to people and they say, oh, we can't, we can never uh, like achieve uh, this, this kind of uh, situation that we have in Copenhagen. And like looking at Copenhagen in the, in the, uh, on the images from the 50s and 60s, uh, you could see that it's a very, very car oriented city. Um, in fact, Copenhagen like built back 25% of its bicycle infrastructure during these years because it was like fully committed to the car as the future of transportation. Uh, it wasn't immune like to this to, to this whole development. And uh, when you kind of um, look at Copenhagen imagery from that time, this is uh, not a bogale. And when you look uh, at the image from 1977 uh, to today, it's like completely uh, changed the layout of the street. I mean, this is like a, almost like a six lane road and here, um, this uh, part of the, the the street is actually completely blocked for cars, and you can only use it on the bike or uh, on uh, with public transport. In in, in this case, uh, the bus. And a little like two hundred meter further down this road, you can actually see, um, yeah, what I meant with like a main car artery going into the city. And something that changed into the most bicycle uh, trafficked intersection probably in the world as far as 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 as, as we know. Yeah, um, I like to to leave you with that image of of, of the morning commute. And um, now I think it's time for some questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Lawrence, for your very interesting and optimistic, I would say, also presentation because. We always tend here to think, where we are inclined to think that 
using an active mobility, it's rather a characteristic of Western European countries, but uh, you showed in your presentation that cities uh, like um, um, in Slovenia or in Colombia, so not, in, not in, in Eastern Europe or even in South America, they uh, became pioneers when it come, comes to sustainable mobility, and that's that only confirms what you you've said before that it's 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 mainly a question of political will whether we decide to change something or not in our mobility pattern patterns, and yes, as you rightly pointed out, now I would like to give the floor to our uh, participants, uh, and I would like kindly to ask you uh, if you have questions or comments. Uh, please um, write in the chat or just raise the hand uh, and uh, I will and address your question if it is possible and if the technology technology allows you with a loud voice and with your face so that we have more interaction. Uh, of course, you can write in the chat as well, but I think that if you could uh, address the questions with loud voice, that would be better. And I would like to give the floor now to Anda Zota from our media partner, because this event um, is organized uh, in partnership with the Igloo Journal. Anda, the floor is yours, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, hi. Uh, first of all, nice to meet you. Hello, Lawrence. Thank you for this uh, lovely presentation. Um, I'm uh, supposed to like ask you a few questions, though I have many, many by now. Um, let me introduce myself. I am uh, editor in chief of Igloo Architecture magazine, and I'm also an architect. We do uh, consider a lot uh, how cities should develop, how cities should, what what is a city, what should it become, uh, both. Uh, in uh, in uh, our work at the magazine and also in our day-to-day -day practice as architects um and even though i am a big fan of copenhagen or because i am a big fan of copenhagen and uh i've been traveling yearly to to copenhagen for like five six years now um, i do feel like there are uh, some slight differences uh, on the what victoria uh, mentioned uh, uh, on the political um i don't know um argues of whether we should build or not uh, a more sustainable urban mobility and um I did actually also study Paris, uh, what you mentioned. Uh, we also like translated uh, Carlos Moreno's uh, book on Droit de Cité, uh, who worked with uh, Mayor Hidalgo on creating this uh, urban connection in Paris. And my first, que my first question to you regards like a more global approach uh, of how cities should should uh, should develop towards uh, sustainable mobility. And um, I would like to ask you, what do you think are like the rights to the city that uh, a contemporary urban city should should include? Um, the, the, the rights uh, to the city? I'm not sure if I understand the, the, the question correctly. You mean the, the um, uh, what, what a city can do or what a city... Uh, is, is what allowed a city to is supposed to what is what what is the city like supposed to give you apart from the urban mobility that should also be included okay apart from 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 the yes. mobility yes <laughs> as a, as a link to it i mean yeah you know to have to to be able to have this urban mobility uh, uh either sustainable uh, you like sh should have to include a much wider infrastructure. Yeah. Um, what does that mean? I mean, in in terms of like, I mean, I'm a, like in mobility, so my approaches are always more or less lead over mobility, uh, and in that regard, I I would simply put like say, uh, you should give the people the ability to choose what kind of mode of transport they want to use um and not force them in one way or another and i don't think like in most cities people have the choice they're basically uh being forced to use a car or something that's kind of like available and safely available to them um apart from that mobility um 
I mean, uh, as a as a city, like as, as an offering from a city to its people, um, I think a big part of it is is available urban space um, that they can use. Uh, a lot of, a lot of people, and we saw this during the last couple of years, uh, don't have the, the the possibility to kind of retract into their homes and 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 spend time there in a in a in a meaningful way. Um, so like it's giving people the opportunity to to spend their time in public space and make public space available for for uh, for for everyone is I think a big um, step towards uh, a sustainable city, uh, especially on a personal level. And it also interacts strongly with 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 urban mobility in a way that like good urban mobility enables and unlocks those public spaces for everyone. It makes them easier to to use and creates more uh, environments where you can just hang out and and spend time. Um, so I think from a from from like urban, as, as far as urban planning goes, apart from mobility, I think uh, those public spaces are pretty important. Um, is that more or less what you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I know you. You answered uh, right. To uh, I, I mean, you, you you fully covered my my question, and um, what I observed when I first visited Copenhagen, like many years ago, uh, is that is actually this the easiness of traveling by bike because I was used to uh, biking around Bucharest, who is not uh, at all a bike friendly city. Um, and I also, uh, being able to visit like uh, during summer or during winter, I observed that people do not feel afraid of biking um, whenever it's cold or windy outside. And in Copenhagen, it is cold and windy. Uh, but how did the municipality convince people that uh, bike, bi bi bicycle is a legit um, mode of transportation? Um, I think it's a, it's always a mix. Uh, I said in the beginning that like the, the environment, like, uh, kind of has an, has an effect on people's behavior and vice versa. Um, I think like how Copenhagen, Copenhagen basically, um, didn't build giant motorways through the city in the, in the, in the sixties and seventies. And they didn't do that because they ran out of money because it was the oil crisis and um, they just simply didn't have to, the funds to to realize those kind of very, very expensive projects. So um, without like this kind of big step that's hard to take back, like once you build like those gigantic structures, it's really hard to politically kind of admit that this was not a good idea. And that it, it, it keeps destroying actually their their urban environment and separates it more than it connects anything. Um, once you don't have that, I think it's easier to go the path of like active transportation much much earlier. So what we saw in Copenhagen in the eighties wasn't like the same development as it was in a lot of other cities, where you um, more and more like gave yourself to the car and to the to this whole development. Uh, and in Copenhagen, in fact, they built more bike lanes and they continued to do so. Um, so you had already like a strong sense of um, cycling mobility um, in, in the 80s and 90s. And then um, in the early 2000s, there was like this, the next push and more conscious push uh, of the city officials where they said like we want to become like a, the most bicycle friendly city it's like a brand that we want to that we want to achieve um so like uh, and then like with that in mind building more and more bike lanes that created more and more cyclists um that kind of created like this this uh, sense of um Kind of also like community in in a way that like uh, an identity that people saw themselves commuting by bike more than anything else really. And at some point, it just 
like now when you ask people why they say clean Copenhagen, they like look at you like like why wouldn't we like it's just, it's, it's we don't even have to think about it yeah that's true that's exactly how it felt uh, and if i may have just the last question uh, from me um you mentioned uh and it's obvious that it's supposed to be this way you mentioned working a lot of municipalities how does your company collaborate with local municipality exactly i mean what kind of projects and reports do you do um uh it differs like uh, momentarily we uh we we often take the hard way uh <laughs> so we answer to rfps uh it uh, there was also cases where cities were like um like talking to us and uh, they were like uh, convinced and then uh we worked with them um directly but uh in in general i would say it's uh it's usually a mix of um infrastructure planning like we give them a plan of where to build what infrastructure in the city and um to to basically achieve like a connected safe network that's like really our main goal is always to have like little network that we start from and then let that grow instead of like building one bike line one bike line one bike line one, one bike line that are completely detached from each other so it's it's much like more reliable that way to to create a, a larger number of cyclists if you start with a network and let that grow and alongside that i think a lot of cities uh, want a communication strategy because well if you start to build bike lanes you always have backlash um considerable backlash and um that's not different in any other city and also copenhagen had a had large communication strategy still has them to this day um to keep basically like people in line and people on their side to like it used to like thank cyclists uh, on on big signs like that they cycle every day it's like showing the appreciation um is, is a big part of it and in the city where where you don't really have a lot of cyclists yet i think a great way to communicate cycling is to tell people what the possibilities are when you when you use your bike and what the uh, what the implications are for yourself like um that you save so much time every day uh that like commuting um being in like that kind of traffic jam uh, on the on the photo is a completely different experience than, than sitting on your car waiting um because like your choice of mobility is very personal and if you want to change people's minds you have to give them personal reasons to to change their um, mode of transport so like the planning and the communication are the, mostly the two things that we that we do for city, for, for cities thank you thank you so much Thank you, Anda, too, for your questions. There is another question in the uh, in the chat, and I will address it to you because, I don't know, probably the microphone doesn't work. So um, the question uh, which is addressed by Mr. Mihai Nanu is uh, referring probably to Romania, saying that our mayors are not happy with taking in popular mobility measures. And uh, the question is, how can we prevail and change the public opinion faster? And here maybe you have some, I was thinking, Lawrence, maybe you have some examples, I don't know, from Bogota or from, from other cities where the, the road to a sustainable mobility was not so easy eventually. So maybe you can share uh, the experience of, of other cities apart from, uh, from uh, Copenhagen. Sure. Um... I mean, I, I don't, I can't, I can't look into uh, uh, a lot of the mayor's like heads, uh, I have to say, but in general, I think no mayor wants to make unpopular uh, decision. Uh, that's like a, a universal thing. And that's also the reason why we are where we are in, in terms of mobility in most, in most countries. And um, the, the thing that like, like in this presentation, I tried to like, tackle a couple of those things like because when when it comes to those kind of investments uh and it's it's not only like monetary investments it's also like political in, 
in investing politically, like risking your re-election if you if you build something that doesn't immediately fly. Um, so giving incentives to to mayors and and city staff that um, uh, with doing this you can just save a lot of money. Like it's still in in most of the cities we work with is a, is a capitalist society. So we have to address things that 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 people deem important. And um, the environmental aspect of it often uh, takes like ages until those effects can probably be seen. And uh, we, like we talk about like climate goals all the time. And I think it's like important for many people, but there's still um, so much other reasons why you should invest in cycling that are probably more um, important for people's day-to-day -day lives right now. Um, and and like i think with a mayor like the, the mayor of bogota for example um you have like the sometimes it just takes a person who's willing to sacrifice their political <laughs> stance uh in the in the short term or it doesn't mean like that you lose your your next your next election we have like many examples where where, where that didn't happen but obviously, like taking that risk, I mean, you're like basically talking about your own job. <laughs> it's 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 kind of a very uh, again a very personal decision, and and I think it's like um, when you look at cities and uh, see how how um, some mayors took certain decisions, I mean, I I like I admire that, uh, but I. I, I I don't know why they well, like which reason for them personally made them change their minds or made them so um, like convinced of the idea that that cycling is a good idea. We see that there is like a global trend uh, that you want to make uh, like sustainable mobility more accessible, and I think there's a lot a lot of like political weight on that as well. So. That together, I think that, that together with like the money aspect and the space aspect, I think you you have a lot of people on your side, and I think that's a good path forward for also like a political discussion. I personally wouldn't invest too much uh, on the environmental thing because, as we see, like in a city as Copenhagen where everybody cycles, the environmental aspect isn't as important as the easiness of travel and the fastness of travel. So I think that's how you get people in the end. Yes, so it's a very concrete personal uh, benefit. Yes, yeah. uh, thank you. There is another question. Uh, Adriano Hotaro raised the hand, Adi, please. Uh, unmute yourself because you are muted right now. We cannot hear you. Uh, uh... Do you it's, it's a very, very bad sound. Uh, we cannot hear. Lawrence, can you hear? Because I'm not able. Uh, I, I'm afraid not. Maybe you can type it quickly. Maybe you um, can type it, please, because it, it's it's an echo or something like that. It's it's the sound is very, 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 very bad. Sorry. Maybe you can type it in the chat. So I know it's. I, ideally, we should ask questions with... Do you hear me now? Yeah, it's perfect now. We'll okay, perfect. I have a bad connection. I'm curious, what do you say to the local authorities or to mayors who might say that uh, cycling is a cultural issue, not necessarily concerning infrastructure? Because uh, what, what I see, because I'm proposing in Romania, I think it would be the, uh, the biggest... Um, bike lane in, in Romania along the Somesh River and s some uh, uh, parts. So I, I can see at the local administration in Cluj-Napoca, which is the second largest city in, in Romania after Bucharest, uh, that I can see uh, them um, agreeing with an idea like this, especially at lower level of administrations. But when we go um, let's say uh, in the metropolitan uh, area to uh, villages nearby, 
this uh, this river uh, they are clearly seeing this in cultural uh, terms i don't know the hipsters saying that we might we should have a bike lane or something like this and uh, i talked to mayors uh, that are saying yeah this bike lane might be good for fishing you know? and i'm saying uh, you have a uh, uh, 15 uh, 000, uh, uh, residence locality that you want to expand at 40,000. It's not only for fishing, it's for uh, mo mobility purposes. Yeah. And I was curious, what are you saying uh, to, I don't know, mayors from different uh, countries or regions who see especially biking as this kind of a cultural uh, um, activity, not, not necessarily sports activity, but a cultural activity of yeah, urban yeah. Lives, of hipsters and, and, and so on. No, I know, I know, I know what you mean. Um, I mean, our like what we always say is that the cycling as a as a mode of transport is not a cultural thing because it has happened everywhere before um, uh, before the car got such a strong stance in cities and and in and and in the countryside as well. Um, so uh, saying that it, it is a cultural thing. Um, especially in, in in an environment that has such a rich culture and rich historic culture like Romania uh, is kind of like sh sh short-sighted because we saw like in both like Australia, Los Angeles, uh, uh, Russia, um, Romania, wherever you look, you saw like an old footage, you saw cyclists uh, basically populating the city and and being like the overwhelming um, uh, mode of transport. And it was just like this artificial um, kind of cut through the through the invention of the car that got rid of this kind of situation. And saying like Copenhagen or Denmark or or the Netherlands have a like a bigger cycling culture, they might have now, but it's like a, a thing that you can, easily change uh, uh, in, 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 a, in quite a short period of time. And how do you change it? You make it like an actual reliable choice for people to, to take their bikes. So then I'm pretty sure, and we've seen it in a lot of cities, uh, a good example that I have was uh, one of the first projects that, um, I saw when I started at Copenhagen as was uh, in Almetiesk in, in, in Tavistan in Russia, where we implemented 50 kilometers of bike lanes in a like, relatively medium-sized city, I would say. Um, so it wasn't like very extremely urban. Uh, so like the cultural aspect of young hipsters, I would say was like very, very low there. Uh, and uh, they, within... Uh, two years they had like a 10% modal share from nothing before and it's just with like good reliable infrastructure that takes people to the schools and to their educational spaces quicker and cheaper than they would go there with 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 car or even public transport in a lot of in, in, in a lot of scenarios so you can create this cycling culture if you want to say so uh, although a lot of people, I think, in Denmark would agree that it's a cultural thing. It's 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 so such a basic commodity. It's such a almost like mechanical thing. You you get up in the morning, you get to drink a coffee, get on your bike, and get to work. You don't think about it. It's not like a, nobody's like passionate about cycling, especially when it's like raining in your face every every second day. So it is just what they do, um, and why? Because it's there and it's available. And making it available is a political, maybe it seems like a political risk for, for many people, uh, especially in politics. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think, um, and you can see it also in Copenhagen that everybody through all ages cycles. It's not only uh, young people doing it. Um, and it's not only uh, people with lower income doing it. It's like everybody, everybody cycles. It's like across all sections. It's not a, like it's not a gender biased or, or anything. Well, I completely uh, agree with what you are saying. I visited uh, Com uh, Copenhagen, but I was thinking in cities, 
as Bucharest or Cluj, where you have 1% uh, cyclists, no? Mm. How do you yeah. convince the mayor uh, or the city administration, not necessarily the, the mayor, that you can get votes out, out of this, yeah? Or uh, not necessarily votes, but you, you might have a larger audience that it's uh, uh, more satisfied uh, you'll have, I don't know, 5%, 10% or something like this. If uh, the percentage uh, at this point, it's, less, uh, let's say, below 1%. So it's not uh, uh, an issue of electoral politics. Yeah. yeah. And they are not necessarily aware of uh, big uh, climate change uh, issues and stuff like this. Yeah. Um, I think, like, I still think that... Uh, Building bicycle infrastructure is a good monetary investment and a relatively low cost investment for, for the benefit it gives. So if that is something that they might be interested in, I think that's a good way forward. Um, and the, a big misconception is that I need cyclists first and then I, I build the infrastructure for them because that's not really how it works. It's, um, it's the other way around in most cases. Uh, so you have to, you have to have a plan uh you have to have a goal and you have to build the infrastructure for that goal and then people will come like you will like people will cycle there and we saw it like in, particularly in this russian city where nobody was really cycling before and they built all this like infrastructure it's insane like uh, protected by planes footrests on the intersections like to make it as comfortable and as easy as, as possible to get around and it just created um bicycle traffic um infrastructure creates cyclists and if you like get that i think that's like one of the first things that 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 uh, that you can that you can convince people with but obviously like there's always um, like mayors that, that are kind of immune to those kind of things it's but that's why you probably would then want to vote for someone else <laughs> <laughs> who who is more like on the on that train. But like I think with with monetary uh, incentives that like you you save so much money as a city as a city uh, as a municipality when you when you build good infrastructure. Um, I think that's a that's a great reason to do it if you don't believe in in the environmental aspects of it or or even in the space aspects of it. Yeah, after all, this is how capitalism is functioning, is, isn't it? You first create the offer, and then the demands come with good marketing. So, yeah, yeah. it's uh, it's also a comment from one of our participants says that saying that maybe the other ninety nine percent non bikers will also become more uh, satisfied with living in the city, um, and then will revote the politician who politicians who did uh, who did this change. But I think it's a very valuable idea that it's basically the infrastructure that uh, creates the, it's a vicious or virtual circle, so to put it, depends. No infrastru infrastructure, no uh, biking. And then if you have infrastructure, you create, you increase the number of bikers. I also have, uh, I think, a last question because I cannot see any uh, hand, hands raised in the, in the Zoom. So um, the question would be, the following. We, of course, learn from best practices and looking at what others did, but we also learn from mistakes. So uh, would you um, give us, I don't know, one or two examples uh, maybe of things, uh, I don't know, cities, projects that only partially succeeded or which have failed and things we should uh, avoid in, in Romania when, when trying to push for a more active uh, mobility? Um... Yeah, I mean, when it comes to bicycle planning, there's a whole, there are like, you could fill books with uh, things that, that, that went wrong. And I think like the general rule of thumb is if you build infrastructure, like first, if you follow like that logic that you build the infrastructure first and then people will use it. Um, and then you have the situation where they build infrastructure, but it's not good. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's too narrow. It just ends. Uh, it's it's fragmented. Is it's not connected. Um, then you very much uh, 
like very often have the situation where you actually had a worse place than before because you built it already and people don't use it. And then you have suddenly people saying that, oh, so it doesn't work. So people don't want to bike. Um, so infrastructure is, 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 is good, but it has to have like basic qualities and, and follow best practice. Um, that's why we're here. <laughs> um to to avoid those mistakes but it's there's like obviously that is just a, that there's like the first step of political will that you want to invest in infrastructure and then there's the second step of political will that you want to invest in good infrastructure because good infrastructure often requires you to take away more space from cars it's like most most of the time that's the case um, so, um, there's like, there's another, there's another barrier and we see that often in, in cities when we work with them, that at some point we, you come to a point where like city stuff is like, yeah, but like, can't we just do like 1.5 meters wide bike lanes and then that's enough, isn't it? Because like, you, see, well, you look around, there's no one cycling right now. And if you give in to that, you, you kind of end up with something that's kind of half-baked. And um, you just have, again, only the people who would have cycled there anyway using that kind of infrastructure, but you don't really create new people. Um, another big mistake in terms of communication is uh, the, like the building of fear. You see that very often in, in, in North America, um, like Toronto had just this, like released this horrible campaign where they like um, kind of follow the rules like as a cyclist just like yeah. follow the rules and you'll be fine and wear a helmet and protect yourself so you don't die and that's kind of also like something like who wants to cycle and constantly get told from like a city level and you see it on like billboards that you will probably die uh doing it i think that's like you you can do a lot of damage with with the wrong communication and um like communi communicating cycling in a positive way and basically telling people that like we as a city we provide the infrastructure for you um to make you safe and then people will automatically follow the rules um we, we see like we do a lot of um, observational studies and you can see that uh, in, in, on an intersection where you have perfect infrastructure everybody will stop everybody will follow the rules or like most people they're always like you know certain people don't um and on intersections that has infrastructure that's not good and not safe even inside of copenhagen there are like situations that that are not like perfectly solved of course you can see how people just don't follow the rules because they don't make sense to them and um we always see that like people complain about like cyclists not following rules and it's interesting because the cities most cities how they are today they are built for cars the whole infrastructure is built like with a focus on, on car driving stop signs are there for cars you have to really explain a cyclist why he should stop completely like wheels stopping on a stop sign it doesn't really make sense it's like uh when you when you cycle yourself um, I, I come across it a lot of times but they then you get fined and then you're like yeah fuck this i'm, I'm, I'm gonna take my car tomorrow because i don't want to deal with this anymore um so they like millions of things <laughs> that uh can go wrong but at the same time it's not rocket science it's like when you follow certain um guidelines when you when you look at best practice examples there's a reason for them to to work. There's a reason for Copenhagen and Amsterdam being so successful, in in in, in that regard. Um, so that's actually also like a good advice when you want to convince a mayor, take him to Copenhagen or take him to Amsterdam, and show him around. Um, that has often, more often than not, changed a lot of minds um, because, like those politicians, they come to Copenhagen. We we've done a lot of tours. Um, with politicians in the past um, where they're like, I, I want this, I want this in my city. I want, like, I want exactly this. How, how can I, how can I get there? Because like, it's just also, uh, they're also just human and you just want to feel, like, you want your city to feel exactly the same 
when you've been there cycling. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So I think we are getting close to the end of our event. So I will, will hand now uh, to, to Annalena Koshik for the final word. Annalena, please. Yeah, thank you, Victoria. So um, I would like to thank you. Th thank you, Lorenz, for um, for the interesting and inspiring discussion. And um, thank you. Thanks all of you for your interest and in joining our event today. If you have any suggestion what we could um, discuss in this series, please feel free to write us. We would be very interested to hear what um, maybe are questions you want to be this uh, want to be addressed in this series um, of events we are doing. And yes, we I think it, it it was a good starting point today to think about um, mobility concepts and um, how to improve um, bicycle infrastructure in the cities of Romania. So, yeah, I hope to see you again in, on in other events. And uh, yes, yeah, so, um, thank you for joining the event today and have a nice evening and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Um, Lawrence, can you send us the um, uh, presentation by email, please? Because there were uh, a few participants that asked it. If it's, if it's okay, okay for you, of course. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Then. Uh, thank you. Have a nice evening. Bye. And, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Lawrence. See you next time or in the future. Bye. 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 Safe travel on the bikes, yes. <laughs>